Good afternoon and welcome to our Monticello live stream. Um, today is letter writing day and we are joined by um, Bill Barker as Thomas Jefferson. And he'll be talking today about Jefferson's voluminous correspondence, some of the important letters that he wrote and some of the more interesting letters that he received. So let us know where you're joining from and put any questions in the comments section for us. Oh, I beg your pardon, my friends, and what a pleasure to be able to be with you again to, and to be joined here at El Monticello. Uh, I have been told that this day is being recognized as a National Letter Writing Day. I could not be the more in favor uh, to recognize one of the most intimate methods of communication amongst ourselves uh, simply amongst the family of man across the globe, and one that has been, as you know, the habit and custom from time immemorial. Uh, many people have asked me about my letters over the years. I think word has gotten out that I have extensive correspondence. Uh, some say that nearly 19,000, perhaps well beyond, into the uh, early 20 of thousands of letters uh, that I will write. And think about all of the ones that I have received. You know, when you're out here in the wilderness, we only have ourselves. And therefore, next to gathering amongst ourselves and good confabulation, that is conversation, uh, one of the most intimate methods of, uh, of communicating is writing letters. We learn it from our youth. So I have uh, gathered some of the letters that I have uh, throughout my life here to be of support for the questions that you have upon letter writing. And so therefore, without um, further comment from me, with the exception of how I should answer your questions, uh, the floor is yours. And Ms. Bell, I would be interested to know what the first question might be. Well, thank you, Mr. Jefferson. How about let's start at the beginning. What was the first piece of mail you ever received? Oh, my heavens. Well, the first piece of mail that I remember was that of, uh, of my family. A mail that I received from my aunts and my uncles and uh, my grandparents when I was a young boy uh, growing up out here at Shadwell uh, Plantation. Uh, then, of course, when uh, my father moved our family to Tuckahoe Plantation, well, at that distance, about two and a half days ride to the uh, southeast, well, then I would write letters to my family back west, that is, back here in Charlottesville and the community. So those were the first letters. Now, if you're asking me uh, what I still have relevant to all of that correspondence from my youth, well, I, I'm sorry to say I have very little, uh, with the exception of perhaps the first correspondence that I still have with me, which is a bill. It is true. It is a bill that I, I received in order to pay my factor, that is, uh, the gentleman responsible for pursuing uh, books that I wished to buy or anything that I wished to buy. Uh, his name was Mr. Thomas Adams. And so the, the bill that I still have amongst my earliest correspondences uh, was sent me from London uh, in October 1769, uh, simply saying, sir, having entered into some engagements with your worthy friend, uh, Mr. Thomas Adams, uh, for Mr. Jordan, and it goes on and lists the number of books that I had ordered to pay for, uh, such as Gordon's History of Parliament, Locke on Government, Ellis's Tracts on Liberty. It is a bill from my earliest days that I still have. <laughs> your next question. Who was your favorite correspondent when you were young? Oh, my. My favorite correspondents were my dear friends, so many, and of course, my sisters. You know, I was one of 10 children. Yes, I had three younger brothers, but I had six sisters. And of course, the young ladies were taught very early in their youth uh, to learn how to write uh, most pleasant letters. Uh, so I enjoyed correspondence with my siblings and my dear friends. Daphne Carr, my earliest friend, God rest his soul. He passed away when he was only 30 years of age. Would that I could still have some of his letters. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there was um, well, Johnny Page, my classmate from the Old World College of William & Mary, our mutual friend, Willie Fleming, 
In fact, I still have a letter here that, uh, that I wrote to, to Willie Fleming. You see, I make copies of all my letters. I've often wondered whether my friends made copies of theirs. So I may have some of their correspondence that uh, they have either forgotten about or, or perhaps um, they've never received some of my letters to them. But here's a copy of a letter that I wrote to Willie Fleming, Richmond, uh, from Richmond in October of 17 and 63, you see, as making copies of my letters, I still have them. And here's what I, I write to him. Uh, when you see Patsy Dandridge, tell her God bless her. I do not like the ups and downs of a country life. Today you are frolicking with a fine girl, and tomorrow you are moping by yourself. Thank God I shall shortly be where my happiness will be the less interrupted. I shall salute all the girls below in your name, particularly Sookie Potter. Oh, dear Will, I have thought of the cleverest plan of life that can be imagined. You exchange your lands for Edge Hill, I mine for Fail Fairfields, you marry Suki Potter, and I marry Rebecca Burrow, and get a, po well, perhaps I should simply end right there. <laughs> oh, these pangs of the heart from my early youth, I dare say, simply reading uh, are still there, though deeply. So we have a question from Chester, more of a comment. He would like you to talk a little bit about penmanship and spelling oh. during your time. Well, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we had to learn to write at a very, very early age as a means of communication, uh, certainly within our families, uh, and then for the conduct of business. So having the opportunity to attend to a school from my youth, and I say the opportunity, lamentably because my family had the means. I've always believed that the opportunity of schooling should be universal. Everyone to have that opportunity, poor as well as wealthy, and the female, let alone the male. So as I attended to schooling at an early age, and that was at Tuckahoe Plantation, where my father had removed our family, uh, you had to learn to read and write first and foremost. And so we would go over and over and over our alphabet, uh, to write, indeed, the capitals, let alone uh, those diminished in letter form. And we had to, to learn to write a straight line across a piece of paper. Uh, otherwise, uh, writing uh, all haphazard over the paper uh, would be certainly disrespectful uh, to the recipient whom you wanted to know uh, that you held a great respect for. So yes, I can tell you from the earliest ages, having the opportunity of schooling, you learned your letters, you learned your capitals, uh, you learned the proper style of writing, an introduction, the body of the letter, and of course, uh, the ending with gratitude and sincerity, uh, my dearest friend. So you talked a little bit about making copies of your letters. Um, so I'm assuming you have many of these. Is there a particular way that you organize your letters and your mail, both incoming and outgoing? Yes. Well, happily, as I um, advanced in various offices in our government, found it of more necessity to be precise in administration, that is, in particular, writing letters, uh, and then having the opportunity to go to France, I continually uh, made an effort to stay ahead of the most efficient method uh, of keeping correspondence. Uh, how you might receive the letters more directly, have them at your disposal to answer the one and then at the other, uh, to make copies of this letters, to rest you assured that you would not forget exactly what you wrote to an individual and continue to stand upon what you wrote rather than to flip this way or that way with a difference of opinion. Uh, keeping copies of your letters helps you to maintain that equilibrium in your opinions and, and particularly the precision and exactitude of what you had said. Uh, and then of course, I keep an epistolary record. I keep a record of all of the letters that I receive and all of the letters that I write and send. Uh, that helps me to keep abreast of the individual, uh, how often I have written to them, uh, how often they have written to me, the necessities of our concerns at the time. And that epistolary record has been with me nearly my entire life. And then in order to easily access 
a, a letter. I have a, an octagonal table uh, that, if you will, in its drawers, both those on the corner, let those alone squared on the sides, uh, have uh, in alphabetical order uh, all of the letters I have written, all of the letters that I have received. So if I wish to go to my copies, uh, to, if you will, my, um, my catalog of letters, uh, it will be more easily accessible uh, if I know exactly where to find that, uh, having discovered it in that octagonal table drawer, uh, beginning with A all the way through. And then, of course, I have learned in receiving so many letters uh, to utilize a pulpit de carte. Uh, that's the French name, a pulpit de carte. It, it is literally a, a pulpit, a high standing um, uh, file, if you will, of the letters you receive. You place those letters in various sections uh, within the cart that is the table uh, in order to, uh, to answer them efficiently, one right after the other. Now, Remember, when I talk about making copies, for the majority of my life, I used a letter press. And that was simply after you wrote the letter, the ink is still somewhat damp. You placed it within a box, uh, the ink, of course, top side. Then you place the sheer paper atop it, and you apply pressure. You roll across those two papers, and then you have the impression of the one beneath it uh, in the one on top. Happily, that's been improved with the polygraph. And so I'm delighted in having discovered this modern advance in making copies of letters. Uh, I purchased six from them, of them uh, from uh, Mr. Peel, Charles Wilson Peel. He was an importer uh, of the polygraph in Philadelphia. And I will not deny, I tinker with them in order to improve them in making copies of my letters. A polygraph? Someone the other day said, Mr. Jefferson, you, you need a lie detector? Well, I would not be surprised that perhaps some Federalist might think so, but no, a polygraph comes from two Greek words, poly, many, and graph, write, to be able to write many times, in particular, two letters at the same time. Uh, it's accomplished by two pens connected together uh, over a board, and you place on the board uh, two uh, pieces of paper, you pick up the one pen to dip in ink, and the one it's connected to will follow in kind. So you're able to make a first copy. So we have a couple of questions here from the audience. Natalia asks if there's an official system or national post of some kind, or did you have to rely on friends or family to send letters? Well, Natalia, I'm delighted to say, and I hope we do not forget, that we do support a, a system of postal roads and post offices. And I wish we could say that it was our ingenuity, that is, at the birth of our nation, that we commenced it. However, Natalia, uh, this was begun well before we became a nation. Uh, as we were governed by Great Britain, well, thousands of miles away, uh, they still made certain that we would have an efficient postal system, particularly upon the the many ports and, uh, and major towns uh, throughout the former colonies. And Natalia, do you know who served uh, to travel those postal roads uh, to make sure they were in proper condition and that the post offices were efficient, efficiently maintained? Dr. Franklin, Benjamin Franklin. And that is the reason why when we began our nation, whom do you think under our constitution President Washington suggested to be the first postmaster of our nation. Correct. Benjamin Franklin. A mentor to so many in so many ways, but a mentor to our nation and the many generations to follow in the necessity of an efficient and uh, well-grounded foundation of the post. So important in human communications. So have you ever written a letter in code? Oh, I will tell you this, you could not possibly represent our nation at foreign courts, that is foreign governments, without being cautious that anything you may write to send back uh, to your home, back to the government of your nation, uh, might be scrutinized, might be opened, no matter how solidly you, uh, you attach your seal, that is the wax, and impress it 
uh, with the seal, your initials, uh, no, it, it will be opened. I, I guarantee you. And so therefore, in that caution, uh, you need to, and I found most importantly, to create a code, a code that only your recipient and you would understand. So yes, while I was serving our nation as minister plenipotentiary at the court of King Louis of France, I created a code by which I could correspond freely uh, with our government. Um, in fact, I, I was delighted that Mr. Madison uh, thoroughly enjoyed the utilizing of the code as well as President Washington. And uh, the two of us, the three of us all together, and there were others, uh, realized that if our mail were opened, and most certainly it was, that we were free uh, to share information and particularly to provide for the better safety and defense of our nation. Now, I will tell you, when I myself held the chair of president, I created another code in order to engage correspondence with Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant Clark. It was necessary because when I commissioned that expedition to set out into terra incognita unknown land, well, anyone could intercept the correspondence that we sent back and forth. And so I created a code specifically for that expedition. And I will tell you now, as the expedition was such a remarkable success, a remarkable success throughout the history of man, truly a legend in its own time, the code word was artichokes, artichokes. And I will tell you something else, being certain that, uh, that we might be able to correspond more efficiently uh, without the knowledge of a single word, I created a cipher wheel, a cipher wheel of all of the 26 letters of the alphabet uh, running right across in 26 wheels, but around the wheel itself, the 26 letters of the alphabet. So by reading certain letters and correspondence, you simply would turn those wheels in order to finally hit the code word that would help you better decipher the information within the letter. In fact, someone told me, Mr. Jefferson, your cipher wheel is now prominently displayed in, they call it a spy museum in our nation's capital city. Well, I'm not going to deny that the French were always the most successful as I knew it in espionage. Well, and so should we. And so I'm happy to have this particular museum in order to keep us abreast of methods by which, again, we can protect and defend ourselves. Janice wonders how you find time to write so many letters with all of the other things you have to do. Well, Janice, I will tell you, you have to manufacture your time. Uh, I've known that throughout most of my life, and I will tell you, as I get older, with less time available, oh, there's more of a necessity to, to make certain that the sun will never capture you in bed. Rise before the sun. I have done so throughout most of my life. Attend to your immediate business. Uh, get all of your correspondence over at the very beginning of the day. I endeavor to do so at breakfast. And I eat but lightly. Remember, Denise, no one never complains for having eaten too little. And so with some coffee, oh, and enjoy that during your letter writing. Oh, I consider it uh, indeed the drink of the civilized world. Uh, then get your correspondence out of the way. Get any administration out of the way. There in the morning, done. You have the rest of the day to engage your further delights and pleasures. And so it is I do, and I try to remain consistently upon that. Make your time, because as the Romans said, tempus fugit. So carpe diem. So have you ever corresponded with anyone in the enslaved community here at Monticello? Oh my, yes. Uh, particularly as I was looking through my correspondence, uh, I have here quite a number uh, of correspondence that I, I shared amongst the enslaved and, and most of them, of course, are with the Hemings family. And John Hemings, a most remarkable and, and well-achieved uh, carpenter. He has overseen most, much of the uh, construction at Poplar Forest, my retreat house down in Bedford County. And, and I have here a particular correspondence that uh, he sent me back uh, in 19, 18 and 19. Dear sir, he said, I have finished the balustrading and the hanging of the petition doors 
and that of the bedroom. I am now about the shutters, and I have pine enough for sills and reels of six windows. I've gotten them all ready to, to put here together uh, in the mortise and tenon fashion. Uh, so, yes, by all, uh, all accounts, uh, it is most necessary. And do you know that um, the enslaved here at our Monticello, all of us having been born and grown up together, our families having known one and the other, uh, for actually some generations, that of my parents and grandparents, that of uh, the late Mrs. Jefferson, well, we continue in correspondence one generation after the next. And, and so it is that I'm delighted to say John Hemming, so far mentioned, corresponds with my grandchildren. And in fact, I have here a letter that my grandchild, uh, Septima, a daughter uh, of my daughter, my eldest daughter, Martha, he writes, my dear Miss Septima, uh, your letter came to me on the 23rd, and happy I was to be able to see it and to know that you yourself have written to me. Uh, let me know how your grandfather is, and uh, glad to know that I hear he is none the worse. Uh, I hope you all to be well and to give my love to your brothers, George and Randa. So you see, you cannot deny the consanguinity uh, that remains with us and how helpful it is and the more intimate to be able to write letters to one and the other. You mentioned your granddaughter. Have you ever received letters from other children, from children in general? Oh, my heavens, yes. <laughs> children I want to write me uh, continually, ask me about my opinions. Um, I would never deny them a reply. As I mentioned, I keep a, a, a correspondence book, uh, an epistolary record. And so I keep all my letters uh, to support that and uh, to write in kind uh, back to children. Uh, that's necess necessary. It further supports them and their interest to continue to write, not only amongst themselves and their family, uh, but to people that they deem important uh, to hear their opinions and to share ideas. Maria wonders, what is the most difficult letter you have had to write? Maria, the most difficult letter anyone must write is to inform another of a malady, a malady that has beset their family, to inform another particularly family of the passing of one of the family members, to inform another, if you will, of a, of a disease that has overwhelmed someone for which you cannot immediately know uh, the prognosis or, or the future. These are the most difficult letters anyone, anyone has to write. You have to write this. It's one thing to simply speak with another if you are there in an immediate gathering. Yes, that is the, the greatest degree of warmth and shared empathy and sympathy uh, that you have. But if they are at a distance, what a lamentable thing in order to share that malady uh, with another because you cannot be there. So you see, to write a letter is the next closest thing. What is one of the most interesting letters you have written or received? <laughs> I consider any letter to be received or, or to write interesting. The reason is simply, it always is putting your mind to work, and not only your mind, but your heart. So here, in consequence, I'm, I will share with you a particular letter that, um, that I wrote, uh, if you will, to, well, to a married lady, a married lady, um, Mrs. Maria Causeway. Now, uh, you may wonder, Mr. Jefferson, writing a letter to a married lady. Well, I knew both her and her husband very well. Her husband was Richard Causeway, and I was oft times in their company together. Uh, but there was one occasion, the occasion in which both Mrs. Causeway and I uh, were together for what we realized would be the last time uh, that I would have to see her into her carriage uh, and wonder when I would ever see her again. Uh, coincidentally, this was when I was in Paris. That is where I met the Causeways. I was introduced to them uh, by our artist, Mr. Trumbull of Connecticut. 
And we became good friends uh, for quite a number of months there. But then the time arrived when I would have to simply bid adieu. And, uh, and so it was uh, that I wrote the following. I have kept this, and many consider it uh, the most interesting letter that they have ever read of me. Uh, why someone else would know of that? Well, <laughs> I, I keep copies. Here it is, to wit, Paris, October 17 and 86. My dear madam, having performed the last sad office of handing you into your carriage at the Pavilion de Saint-Denis and seeing the wheels get actually into motion, I turned on my heel and walked more dead than alive to the opposite door where my own was awaiting me. Seated by the fire, solitary and sad, the following dialogue took place between my head and my heart. <laughs> head. Well, friend, you seem to be in a pretty trim. <laughs> heart. I am indeed the most wretched of all earthly beings. Overwhelmed with grief, every fiber of my frame distended beyond its natural powers to bear. I would willingly meet whatever catastrophe should leave me no more to feel or to fear. Ed, these are the eternal consequences of your warmth and precipitation. This is one of the scrapes into which you are ever leading us. Well, I'll stop right there. But uh, many consider that the, the most interesting that, uh, that I have written. Now, I wish you to know I, I wrote a, a letter that I will ever consider interesting to Mr. Madison and corresponding with him while I was in France and he attending to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. This was September 17 and 87. And I wrote him a letter realizing that our Constitution uh, was very, very quickly taking shape. You know, I had always been in favor of the Articles of Confederation, I considered them a venerable fabric. However, it was the mighty Madison, the most luminous mind I've ever known, who convinced me of the necessity of the Constitution. But I made certain, I made certain that I suggest to him that the Constitution needs a Bill of Rights. Well, that's what keeps it in the hands of the people. I made certain that the Constitution, in dividing the government into three particular branches, will allow those branches to check the power of one and the other. I made certain that having a Bill of Rights to keep the Constitution in the hands of the people will always allow for majority rule, the majority of the people in the expression of their opinion, and that it will secure freedom for religion, freedom for the press, freedom for trial by jury. And so I consider that very important to get my particular opinion across. Um, I will tell you as well that uh, I wrote a letter to Mr. Eldridge Jerry, Mr. Madison's vice president. And this was a discussion about our government in the year 1799 and what could happen in the turmoil that was being created, uh, uh, which would, of course, uh, be manifest in the presidential election of 1800. And I wrote him that... Um, we should always be mindful not to go back to the ages of the darkest ignorance, to think that anything was created then cannot be improved upon now or in the future, and to be ever mindful particularly in matters of morality, in matters of religion, in matters of good manners, in matters of the law, that they consistently change throughout human history, and that therefore keep an ear and an eye that the earth belongs to the living generation and that a child of 14 cannot wear the same clothes at the age of 40. And here I was delighted to see a particular letter. I think it's most interesting considering my reception at the court of King George III in England, though there are various opinions as to how I was received uh, as the author of the Declaration of American Independence. Uh, I did not simply appear to him a uh, soul. Uh, I was introduced to the monarch at his court there at St. James's uh, by Mr. Adams. And uh, there have been very account, various accounts of the occasion, but you can only imagine the sentiments that were obviously visible 
when the monarchy, not only the monarch, uh, bore witness to the actual author of the Declaration of American Independence. But I have always made an effort since, particularly in the capacity of chief magistrate of our nation, to be delicate in our diplomacy. So my point, I'm delighted to share with you a letter that I wrote. This is in April, April the 20th, 1803, as president, <laughs> to the Queen of England, Queen Charlotte, the wife of King George, to wit, Madam, our good friend, I have named James Monroe, Minister Plenipotentiary of the United States of America, to your royal consort. My knowledge of his good qualities gives me full confidence that he will so conduct himself as to merit your esteem. I pray, therefore, that you yield entire credence to the assurances which he will bear to you of our friendship, and that God may always have you, Madam, our good friend in his holy keeping. We've got a question from Judy asking if you have corresponded with anyone about your interest in weather patterns and climate. I, I certainly had made a point to do so, particularly with the American Philosophical Society. Uh, this was a discussion that Dr. Franklin and I had frequently a particularly a discussion that the late Mr. George Wythe and I had frequently. That is where I'd learned in my youth uh, to keep a steady account of record, uh, a steady account of the weathers, uh, taking the temperature sometimes three times a day. And uh, so it is that I share uh, these accounts or an overall opinion of either their consistencies, their uh, variety, their vagaries uh, with others because sharing scientific information is most useful in order to build a foundation of fact. And is that not what science provides for us? A, a knowledge of the facts, the realization they do not happen overnight, but they take generations, if not centuries and millennium uh, to discover through open objective observation. So not only to keep these weather accounts for myself, consistently, but to share them with others, particularly in correspondence, how else except in a, a conversation that you're uh, privileged to have uh, personally, uh, to share this information with others, then continues to solidify and strengthen uh, these scientific observations over vast uh, areas and uh, to great extents of a nation or around the world. I think we have time for one more question. And you talked a bit about some interesting letters that you'd written, but what do you feel is the most important letter that you've ever had to write? Our Declaration of American Independence. It is a letter. It's not a proclamation. It's not a law. If it were a law, good heavens, all men are created equal. Well, all the enslaved, not only here at Monticello Poplar Forest upon my lands, but throughout our country, would have been free as of July, 1776. Our Declaration of American Independence is a letter. It's a declaration of our intention, a declaration of our promise our promise not only to ourselves, but the promise to the family of man across the globe, a beacon light to mankind in recognition of our inalienable rights, the rights that are given to us, not by any government, not by any ruler, the rights that are given to the family of man by nature and nature's God. It is a letter, again, formed in three parts, an introduction, a body of the letter, and the fini, the, the ending of the letter, purposeful. Firstly, in, in the introduction, to pronounce boldly those inalienable rights of man. And second, in the body of the letter, to remind us what can happen if we forget about these inalienable universal rights shared by everyone, which of course means that inalienable right of every individual to self-government. The second part reminds us of all of the grievances all of the grievances which we suffered uh, here in the colonies of Great Britain, governed by a monarchy 3,000 miles away, 
the, the memory that as Englishmen, we had the right to petition for redress of grievances, and yet it made no difference because no matter the right, we were not represented in Parliament. So never fail to read the second part of our Declaration of American Independence to reacquaint you with what can happen if we can forget the inalienable right of every individual. And most importantly, the last part, the finale, the finale, if you will, is our compact. That which we achieved never before seen in human history, pulling together, drawing together 13 individual nations. E pluribus unum. Keep wondering as you read our promise, our declaration, how did we do that? We did that because we are remarkable people. We always have been. And therefore, our declaration reminds us of that remarkable capacity to be American. To be American. And through compromise and resolution to continue to pull ourselves together, e pluribus unum, the world's best hope. Well, I certainly thank you for this opportunity that we could gather today, that you provided me to look back on all of my correspondences. Well, those are the ones from the past. Uh, I hope that uh, I can continue to share with all of us uh, my opinions, uh, my hopes, uh, my prayers uh, for the generations yet unborn, and to continue to move forward rather than backward, and to realize what more we have to achieve in the promise of being American. Well, rest you assured, as I have ended many a correspondence, I remain your humble and obedient servant, Thomas Jefferson. Godspeed.